Hi, uh, welcome back. So we uh, continue with our discussion of uh, discrete time Markov chains. Let me share my screen. So uh, let's start with a very quick recap of what we saw last time. We uh, defined what a discrete time Markov pro process is. Uh, it's that uh, the future of the process is conditionally independent of the past given the present state. That's what makes a process Markovian. Uh, we saw how to uh, describe the time evolution of this chain. It's, if it's a time homogeneous Markov chain, then uh, its evolution is completely described by a single matrix called the one-step transition probability matrix. So given this, you can work out all the joint distributions of the chain. Uh, then we started looking at long-term behavior of Markov chains. Uh, and saw so that uh, if there is a probability distribution pi on the state space such that pi times p is pi, such that it satisfies these global balance equations, uh, then such a distribution is invariant, meaning that if the Markov chain is in the distribution pi at time t, it remains in the distribution pi forever. Uh, that uh, the next natural question is, is there always such an invariant distribution? We saw that um, for finite state chains, there is. We didn't see, but we stated that in general, this is not true. Uh, and we also postponed the discussion of uniqueness. So in this lecture, we are going to introduce some more concepts which we need in order to talk about uniqueness. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start by describing the communicating classes of a Markov chain. Uh, so we say that a state X is accessible from some other state Y, or maybe even from the state, same state, but from some state Y. If there is some time T bigger or equal to zero, and we do allow equality here, so if there's some, some time t for which the t-step transition probability matrix pt has the yx element strictly positive. So what does this mean? Uh, so pt is the t-step transition probability matrix. Its elements are, so the yx element is the probability that we go from state y to state x in t time steps. And we say that x is accessible from y if it's possible to go from y to x, meaning that there is some time t for which the probability of going from y to x in t time steps is strictly positive. Does that make sense? Okay, so, uh, X is accessible from Y if we can get from Y to X at some time. And we say that X communicates with Y if both these things are true, that X, you, we can get from Y to X and we can also get from X to Y. And we write X C Y to denote this. Okay, so this, this uh, C then defines a relation on the state space S. It's a subset of the Cartesian product of S with itself. Okay, it says two states X and Y are related by this communications relation if they communicate with each other. Uh, the important point to note now is that C is an equivalence relation on the state space S, meaning that it is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Let's go through that slowly. What does it mean to say a relation is reflexive? It means that every element is related to itself. So we must have x c x for every x in the state space. Is that true? 
Uh, yes, it's true because let's take t equals zero here. So p to the zero is the identity matrix. And then for the identity matrix, all its diagonal elements are strictly positive. In fact, they are equal to one. So uh, I x x is one, which means that x is related to itself. X communicates with itself. You can get from x to x in zero time steps. Okay, so the relation is reflexive. Is it symmetric? Symmetry means that whenever x is related to y, then y is related to x. If we look at the definition, the form of the definition itself is symmetric. So x has to be accessible from y and y has to be accessible from x. So by definition, the relation is symmetric. Finally, is it transitive? What does that mean? It means that if x is related to y and y is related to z, then x has to be related to z. Is that true? Well, if x is related to y, then there's some t1 such that it's possible to get from x to y in t1 time steps, meaning that the x y element of p to the t1 is positive. Similarly, it's possible to get from y to z in t2 time steps because y communicates with z. And now given these two statements, it's possible to get from x to z in t1 plus t2 time steps. So it's possible, so z is accessible from x. And by the same sort of reasoning, x is accessible from z. So indeed, x communicates with z. So that shows that this relation is also transitive. Uh, and since it's all these three things, it's an equivalence relation. So communicates as an equivalence relation on the state space. And what does that imply? That implies that it imposes a partition of the state space. It partitions the state space into equivalence classes, and we call these communicating classes. Uh, we'll need another definition or terminology. So we call a Markov chain irreducible if all its states belong to a single communicating class, meaning that every state communicates with every other state, that it's possible to get from anywhere to anywhere else and back. So the state space is not, cannot be split up into distinct communicating classes. The smallest way of splitting it up is to keep it whole. In that sense, it's irreducible. Okay, and here's a pictorial depiction of what such a uh, decomposition into communicating classes looks like. Uh, so here we have a state space that consists of three communicating classes, uh, A, B, and C. So, any two states within the same class communicate with each other. So given two states in A, it's possible to get from one to the other, similarly for B and similarly for C. Uh, it, now, that doesn't mean that there's no way of getting from one state in one of these classes to a state in the other. It can be possible to do that. So maybe we can get from some state in A to some other state in B, and here's another example of a state in A from which you can go to another state in B. But what cannot happen is to have arrows in both directions. If it's possible to go from here to there and possible to go from some other state in B to some other state in A, then these two must belong to the same communicating class because if you can go here from X to Y and then from Z to W, it's also possible within a communicating class from go to, from y to z and then from z to w, etc. So then these should form the same communicating class. So you can have arrows pointing one way between two communicating classes, but not both ways. Or you may have no arrows at all as with C. You can't get from A to C or from C to A and similarly between B and C. Um, okay, so you might already see why communicating classes are interesting 
when it comes to discussing long-term behavior. So in this picture, what, what can we say about long-term behavior? If we start out in states in, okay, if, let's start in C first. If we start in the communicating class C, what happens over time? We stay in C forever. It's impossible to leave the set C. So any initial condition on C will just leave us remaining in C forever. Uh, and so the long-term behavior is to stay in C. What, if, what happens if we start in A? And let's now assume that all these sets are finite. If we start in A, then we move around in A for some time, and eventually we are going to hit this state from which it's possible to go to B. Maybe the first time we hit it, we don't move to B, we stay in A, we continue on and so on. But we'll keep coming to the set repeat, uh, point repeatedly, and at some point we move to B. And once we move to B, we are going to be stuck in B forever because there's nowhere else you can go. Uh, and if we started in B, we would again stay in B forever. So what's the long-term behavior of this Markov chain? It's to either remain in set B forever or to remain in set C forever, depending on where you started. So there cannot be a unique invariant distribution for this chain because which of these sets you end up in in the long term depends on where you started. So there must be at least two different invariant distributions, one uh, which puts all its mass on C and another which puts all its mass on B. And indeed, that's what happens. Okay, but before coming to that, let's also talk about uh, uh, transience and recurrence of states. So we'll call a state X in the state space transient if uh, starting in the state X at time zero, uh, the probability that we return to state X at some later time so here we are looking at T strictly positive. So what we are saying is that uh, the probability that at some time, at any later time T, we are back in the state X is strictly smaller than one. Uh, meaning that starting in state X, the probability of ever returning to the state is smaller than one. Uh, let me just draw your attention to the fact that this qualifier there exists is inside the probability. So probability there exists T such that this is true is not the same as there exists T positive such that probability blah, blah, blah. So uh, remember that the order of uh, these quantifiers matters. So once again, the prop. Starting in state X, the probability that there is any future time at which we are back in X is strictly smaller than one. And if this happens, we call the state transient. An implication is that the number of times the Markov chains returns to this particular state X is finite with probability one. So the first time you start, you return with some probability P strictly smaller than one. Uh, then what's the probability you return once again? Uh, so it's another factor of P. So the probability you return twice is P squared. The probability you return three times is P cubed and so on. And so after a geometric number of returns to the state, you will never return. So the number of returns is finite necessarily. Uh, okay, this is a typo again. So call a state X in S, uh, no, this is fine, sorry. Call a state X recurrent uh, if, uh, if the probability of return is one. So if we start in state X, we are guaranteed to return uh, at some future time. Yeah, maybe here it's easier to see that switching the quantifiers is not uh, Correct. So if you took the 
there may exist no future time t positive such that this probability is one. In fact, typically it won't exist. For every future time, the probability of being back in state x is strictly smaller than one, but the probability that eventually you are back in the state is one. And that's what we are asserting. So a state is recurrent if starting in that state, you are guaranteed to return to it at some random time in the future. And if a state is recurrent, uh, then the number of visits is infinite because you start at X, you come back after some random time, possibly very big. Then starting at that time, you come back again at, uh, after yet another independent random time and so on. And so you keep repeating this infinitely often. Okay, so, and these are mutually exclusive conditions. So every state is either transient or recurrent. Uh, a bit of thought will show you that if one state in a communicating class is transient, then every state is also transient in the same communicating class. Similarly, if one state is in a communicating class is recurrent, then every state in that communicating class is also recurrent. So we can speak of transients and recurrence for a whole communicating class rather than just for a single state. Okay, and a finite state Markov chain always has a recurrent communicating class. Why is this true? Uh, suppose every, trans every communicating class was transient. As we saw, a transient state can be visited only finitely many times. And this state space itself is finite. So each of these transient classes has only finitely many states. So the, the number of times you visit the whole class is finite. Uh, and similarly for every other class. So, uh, so what does this say? It says that after some finite amount of time, the Markov chain is in none of its states. And that's impossible. It can't leave the state space. Uh, so if there were only, if every state were transient, since it could visit each state only finitely many times, it would have nowhere to go after a finite amount of time. And so there must be a recurrent, recurrent communicating class. Uh, so in term, yeah, so uh, eventually you end up in one class and stay there forever. Uh, so what does, uh, so let's come back to invariant distributions. So uh, if a Markov chain is irreducible, uh, then, uh, so now I'm going to make some assertions which we will not prove. You might have seen proofs of some of these in your uh, probability two course. The proofs are easy in the finite state case. Uh, not so easy in the uh, case of countable, countably infinite state spaces. Uh, okay, so the first assertion is that if a Markov chain is irreducible, it has a unique invariant distribution. It may have none, but, uh, but so if one exists, the invariant distribution is unique. Uh, and we also saw already that if the state space is finite, then it has at least one invariant distribution. So if it's finite state space and irreducible, then it has a unique invariant distribution. Uh, if it's a finite state space, but not irreducible, then you have a separate invariant distribution on every recurrent communicating class. Uh, okay, and here's, uh, here are a couple of examples of what can go wrong in the infinite state space case. So let's take the state space to be the integers. That's not finite. And let's look at the simple asymmetric random walk. What, what do we mean by this? A simple random walk is one that moves just one step at a time. So string along the integers on the number line 
So from any integer k, you can go to k plus one or to k minus one. Uh, and uh, the probabilities of these are going to be constant. So it's always p to go to the right, q to go to the left. And p plus q obviously has to add up to one because these are the only possibilities. It's asymmetric if p is not equal to q. So let's say p is bigger than half and q is smaller than half. That means it's more likely to go to the right than to go to the left, more likely to go towards bigger integers. Okay, so if we consider uh, the state space, uh, the, the, this Markov chain, well, it's clearly irreducible because you can get from any integer to any other integer eventually. It's also transient. It tends to drift off to plus infinity because it's more likely to go to the right. So if you start at some state, let's say 27, you <coughs> maybe your first step is to the left and then you are guaranteed to come back or maybe your first step is to the right, in which case there's some positive probability that you will uh, drift off to the right and never come back. And so you can work out that the probability of coming back is strictly smaller than one. It's not completely obvious, but you can work it out. Uh, and since it's transient, it has no invariant distribution. Okay, or it turns out it has no invariant distribution. Let's just say that. So this is one example of where things can go wrong. And here things go wrong because uh, the state space is transient. Uh, the next example is a bit more complicated. Well, the picture is almost the same. We are now going to start with the simple symmetric random walk. So again, the state space is the integers. Again, we have a random walk where we go from any integer k to either k plus one or k minus one. Uh, and it's symmetric because in this case, p equals q equals half. You are equally likely to go to the right or go to the left. Again, this random walk is irreducible, much the same reasoning as before but it's recurrent. If you start at any state, you are guaranteed to come back to that state. And this is, uh, this is not at all obvious. This is quite a difficult calculation, but it can be shown that you are guaranteed to come back. Uh, but this Markov chain doesn't have an invariant distribution either. Uh, again, that's just a fact which you may have seen before. Uh, and the, the only reason I'm mentioning it is that we need a bit more than recurrence for um, infinite state Markov chains. We need something called positive recurrence, which I won't go into, uh, but you might have seen it before or you can read up about it if you're interested. Uh, you need positive recurrence in order to have an invariant distribution. In words, what you need is that not only starting from any state X, not only are you guaranteed to eventually return to it, the mean return time should be finite. And on an infinite state space, uh, you can have infinite mean return time even when you're guaranteed to return. And if that happens, then there's no invariant distribution. Okay, so th there are some technicalities here. By and large, we don't have to worry about these in this course because as I mentioned, uh, we'll mostly be dealing with finite state Markov chains. It's just that uh, since uh, Markov chains are an important part of this course, you should also be aware of these technicalities and not jump to conclusions when dealing with them. Good, so we have... Uh, Again, a quick recap, we have said that every uh, Markov chain uh, can be decomposed into communicating classes and we can uh, study it one communicating class at a time. And if we pick a communicating class which is irreducible and if it also happens to be 
finite state, then it has an invariant distribution and that invariant distribution is unique. So that's the simplest setting to be in. And we, given any Markov chain, we can decompose it into pieces. Uh, given any finite state Markov chain, we can decompose it into pieces such that uh, the pieces that are relevant for long-term behavior will have this form, will be reducible. There will also be pieces which are transient, but those play no role in the long-term behavior. Uh, good. So back to long-term behavior and why should we care about invariant distributions? Uh, so we already saw that if we start in the invariant distribution, we stay there forever. Uh, Okay, that's just like fixed points or invariant sets for differential equations. Uh, but we are, it's very unlikely that we are going to start in exactly this distribution or with a differential equation, it's very unlikely we start at a fixed point. So why is it interesting? For differential equations, it's interesting because uh, quite often, even if you don't start in a fixed point, uh, you eventually end up in one, or if not in a fixed point, maybe in a more complicated invariant set. And something similar happens with Markov chains. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just talk about what do we mean by long-term behavior of a Markov chain, and what happens if we start in some other distribution. Um, so what we mean by long-term behavior is we, we are interested in the fraction of time spent in any state. Uh, and this is related to lo loss of large numbers. Let's go back to the very simple example of repeatedly tossing a fair coin. What do we know in that case? Uh, if you toss a fair coin a million times, you know that you are going to get uh, very nearly half a million heads and half a million tails. So the fraction of heads and the fraction of tails converge to the probability of head and the probability of tail. Uh, that's called the law of large numbers. It's an example of an ergodic theorem, in this case for IID sequences of random variables. And there's a similar theorem for Markov chains. You don't have to have IID events. And the theorem says the following. So if we have a Markov chain xt, time is discrete, takes values in the natural numbers. And suppose this Markov chain is irreducible. It has state space S and it has a unique invariant distribution pi. If all these things are true, then for any state in the state space, the fraction of time spent in that state converges to pi x, the probability of that state. Okay, so let's uh, look at the left-hand side of this equation a bit more carefully. So what do we have here? Uh, this one here denotes an indicator random variable. So one is the, of an event is the indicator of the event. If it's true that the Markov chain X at time S is in the state space X, then this random variable will take the value one. If at time S it's in some other state Y, then this random variable will take the value zero. That's the definition of the indicator random variable. Okay. So what is the sum doing? It's counting all the times between one and T that the Markov chain is in state X. It counts the number of visits to state X in the first T time steps. And then we are dividing by T, so it's the fraction of time spent in state X in the first T time steps, and we let T go to infinity. So that's the long-term fraction of time spent in state X. And that we claim converges to pi X. And this is true for every state in the state space. And that's what the ergodic theorem for Markov chain asserts. Uh, 
Okay, I hope that's clear. It's worth taking a moment to think about this and make sure the statement is completely clear. Okay, let me also add that this statement doesn't depend on the state space being finite. It's true for any countable state space chain, uh, but we are assuming the uniqueness of the invariant distribution. If all that is true, then their codec theorem holds. Good. So that's one characterization of long-term behavior. And <coughs> Can we ask for more? So can we ask that starting in any arbitrary initial distribution mu, mu zero, that the distribution mu t at time t converges to this invariant distribution pi? Well, for this to be true, pi should be unique, but suppose that's true, does it converge? And if there's more than one, does it converge to one of them? But we'll look at just the case when there is one uh, and uh, the case where there's more than one, that there are many communicating classes and you can look at one irreducible class at a time. So if it's irreducible, there's going to be just one and we ask, does it converge to that? Okay, in order to answer that question, we first need to talk about periodicity. Um, so this is another technicality that can get in the way. Uh, okay, so we are given a Markov chain XT, a discrete time Markov chain on some state space S. And we define the period of a state X as the greatest common divisor of all possible return times to that state. So let's uh, look at that more slowly. So we are conditioning on being in state X at time zero. We want to look at the probability that at some future time uh, T, we are back in state X. If the probability of that event is strictly positive, that's saying that it's possible to be back in state X at time T, meaning that we can return to state X in T time steps, okay? So we are looking at all possible return times here, all T for which this, is, this probability is positive, and we are looking at the greatest common divisor of that set. And that greatest common divisor is what we call the period of the state. And we call the state aperiodic if this greatest common divisor is one. Okay, and you can, uh, check that all states in the same communicating class have the same period. This is not too hard to see. Uh, so uh, if, if a Markov chain is irreducible, there's just one communicating class and all states have the same period. And we call an irreducible Markov chain aperiodic if all its states are aperiodic, meaning that they all have period one. And then the statement is that if a Markov chain is irreducible, aperiodic, and has an inv unique invariant distribution pi, uh, then the marginal distributions converge to pi, which should be capital pi point-wise, meaning that uh, uh, the probability distribution at time t, the probability of any state x at time t converges to pi of x as t goes to infinity. Okay, and this fully characterizes the long-term behavior. So this is, uh, this is as much as we could possibly ask for. Starting in any distribution whatsoever, we converge to the invariant distribution. Uh, and then we stay there. Okay, we never exactly reach it, but we get closer and closer to it. And if we start in pi, then we stay there forever. Uh, okay, maybe just a brief comment on a periodic. Um, I, sh I should ideally have a picture here, which I don't, I think. Yeah, I don't. Uh, uh, it's easiest to 
So consider a random walk on a square. So you, let's number the vertices of the square, one, two, three, four, going around the square. If you start at vertex one, uh, then in one time step, you can go either to vertex two or to vertex four. If you start at two, you can go to one or three, etc. So if you start in an odd vertex, in one time step, you're always in, a, in an even vertex. If you start in an even vertex, one time step later, you are in an odd vertex. So when can you possibly return to a vertex? Clearly, you can return only after an even number of time steps. And so <clears throat> the greatest common divisor of all possible return times is two. In this, in this example, the period of every state is two, <clears throat> okay? So this Markov chain is not aperiodic, and this uh, claim result breaks down to the, for this Markov chain. Why is this true? You can work out the invariant distribution for this chain. Let's suppose it's a symmetric random walk. All the pro transition probabilities are a half then the invariant distribution is uniform by symmetry. So it's one quarter at each vertex. But if mu naught, if you start at an odd numbered vertex, then at all even time steps, you are at an odd numbered vertex. So mu t for even t can only assign probability to vertices one and three whereas mu t for odd t can only assign probability to vertices two and four. So <clears throat> the mu t's for different t alternate between probability distributions on one, three and probability distributions on two, four. They never converge to pi, which is uniform on all four vertices. But the averages, if you average over odd times and even times, that does converge, the long-term fraction of time spent in each state is a quarter, but necessarily those times are spent either at odd time steps or at even time steps. So that's why periodicity plays a role. Okay, so the last topic I want to talk about on Markov chains is reversibility. Uh, there's a long section in the notes on reversibility, and it's not important that um, uh, it's there for general interest. You don't need to follow the proofs in detail or all the details of the arguments, but it is useful. It, 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 reversibility is extremely useful, so you should at least have an intuitive idea of it and be able to use it in calculations. So let's start with the intuition. Uh, what does it mean to say a Markov chain is reversible? Intuitively, it's reversible if it looks the same forwards in time or backwards in time. If, if we make a movie of this Markov chain, uh, of its transitions, uh, then you would not be able to tell whether I'm playing the movie the way it was made or I flipped it around and played it in reverse time. Uh, because all the conditional probabilities would look the same. Let's go back to the example of the uh, of random walks on the integers. So let's say we had an asymmetric random walk. It was biased towards the right. If I took a movie of this and reversed it, you could tell the difference whether it was forwards in time or backwards in time, because as you followed the particle in forward time, it would tend to drift to the right. In reverse time, it would tend to drift to the left, and you would be able to tell the difference. But if I took the symmetric random walk and played it in reverse time, you wouldn't be able to tell. It would look exactly the same in forward or backward time. Uh, and any Markov chain with that property is called reversible. Um, okay, so that's a definition. Maybe that's maybe not so useful. What's useful is the following characterization. You can tell whether a Markov chain is irreducible by performing a calculation. So suppose we have an irreducible Markov chain xt 
uh, time is now going to be indexed by the integers. Uh, the transition probability matrix is P, and there's some state spaces, maybe finite, maybe infinite. Uh, and such a Markov chain is reversible uh, if and only if there is some probability distribution pi on the state space such that the following is true. So if we look at any pair of states x and y in the state space, then pi x times pxy is the same as pi y times pyx. Okay, that's formal. Intuitively, what's that saying? If, if, you watch, if you're watching this movie of this Markov chain, pi x is the long-term fraction of time, it's in state x. So if you watch this a million time steps of this movie, uh, pi x is what, what fraction it'll be in state x, roughly. Pxy is the one step transition probability that when it starts in x, one time step later, it's in y. So pi x times pxy is the number of transitions from x to y that you're seeing in the forward time movie. Now, in the reverse time movie, uh, pi y pyx is the number of times you're seeing transitions from x to y or y to x in forward time or x to y in reverse time. And this is saying that for every pair of states, you can't tell whether the movie is being played forwards in time or backwards in time, just looking for at a pair of states at a time. And if this is true for every pair of states, then combined with the Markov property that says that the whole movie, even not looking just at two time steps, but at 20 time steps, so or longer stretches, you can't tell the difference. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the condition. So that explains why you have a condition of this form. Now this set of equations is called the local balance or detailed balance equations. And if they have a solution, and if that solution is a probability distribution on the state space, uh, then uh, then your Markov chain is reversible. And not only is it reversible, this solution pi is the invariant distribution of the Markov chain. Okay. Uh, which I didn't write. Not only is uh, the Markov chain reversible, but pi is also the invariant distribution. Okay, typically these equations, you can write these equations for any Markov chain and typically they won't have a solution. So if your state space is of size n, we saw already for the global balance equations, we got n equations in n variables, but here we have n choose two equations in n variables. We have a lot more equations than variables and typically these will be inconsistent. But if they happen to be consistent, that's the same as the Markov chain being reversible. Okay. And the reason this is useful is that uh, for many Markov chains on large state spaces, uh, these can be much easier to solve than global balance equations. You, you'll find, uh, you might find that you can write down the global balance equations, but it's it's very hard to solve. Uh, but if you are optimistic and you hope that the Markov chain is reversible and try to solve the local balance equations, you might get lucky and find a solution. And if you do, then they also necessarily solve the global balance equations and pi is invariant. So you, you have an example of this in your first problem sheet. Okay, that finishes our discussion of discrete time Markov chains. So let me quickly recap everything we've done so far. We started by defining what a discrete time Markov chain is. Uh, we said that it's fully characterized by its one-step transition probability matrix if it is a time homogeneous chain. Uh, 
So given the one-step transition probability matrix, you can work out all joint distributions. Uh, then we moved on to look at long-term behavior. We showed that if the Markov chain has an invariant distribution and we start in this distribution, then we stay in it forever. In order to answer the question of when it has invariant distributions, we uh, looked into the, what structure is imposed on the state space by the one-step transition probability matrix. So the, uh, the transition probability matrix tells us which states communicate with each other, and that is an equivalence, communicates as an equivalence relation on the state space, so it partitions the state space into communicating classes. And we can understand the long-term behavior of the Markov chain by looking at one communicating class at a time. And the kinds of communicating classes that are particularly interesting are irreducible ones because you can't break them up further. Uh, and these are the only ones that matter for the long-term behavior of the Markov chain. We also classified states into transient and recurrent. It's only recurrent communicating classes that matter for long-term behavior in a finite state chain, which is the only type we are going to be interested in, there will always be a recurrent communicating class. And if it's finite state, it will also be irreducible, or no, uh, it can be broken up into irreducible ones. So if we look at one irreducible recurrent communicating class, then it has an invariant distribution and it is unique. Uh, Okay, and that's, uh, that's the setting we are interested in. Now, the invariant distribution for any Markov chain, uh, not necessarily reducible, not necessarily finite state, so long as there is a unique invariant distribution, it characterizes the long-term behavior in the sense that the fraction of time spent in any state is exactly the invariant probability of the state. Under additional conditions of a periodicity, starting in any distribution, we end up uh, converging towards the invariant distribution. So that's the strongest sense of uh, convergence uh, of uh, long-term behavior. That's the, so we fully characterize long-term behavior in that sense. And finally, we introduce the notion of reversibility, which uh, greatly simplifies calculation of invariant distributions if your Markov chain happens to be reversible, which is unusual, but which uh, happens often enough for reasons of symmetry in various examples we we'll look at in this course. Okay, so that uh, ends the discussion of uh, discrete time Markov chains. In terms of the lecture notes, this is the first nine pages of notes. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, and next time we will start with continuous time Markov chains.